All right. Thanks so much for joining us. You are all stuck with me today because Brian Karpf is uh, not on vacation. He's actually working extraordinarily hard and wasn't able to join us today. So today, uh, welcome to Tech Talk Law. And my name is Melissa Kuczynski, for those of you who haven't been with us before. And today's topic is extraordinarily important as we're all working from home and as I think many of us are deciding that well we're going to keep working from home for at least part of our law practices as we go forward. So I'm joined today by Nick Himenitis. and <laughs> I said it right. There we go. So uh, I'm going to be talking to Nick and he's going to share with us some information about how to ensure your tech is secure which he's gonna correct me a million times, I guarantee, and he better, and he better chastise me when I admit what I'm doing wrong. So hopefully we can all figure out um, a good way to move forward with our technology as we're working from our, our home computers, which we're now going to become our mobile offices in the future. So thanks so much, Nick, uh, for joining me today. Um, hopefully you can give us just a little bit about what you do so that we have a sense of who you are. Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's my pleasure to join you this afternoon. Um, uh, <clears throat> so uh, I am a recovered attorney. Um, I am a licensed attorney in New York. I uh, years ago did practice in uh, Maryland, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. Um, I stopped practicing law about 20 years ago. Um, and went back into doing investigations and technology uh, work full time. Uh, and since then, I have uh, developed a practice, the name of my firm is the NGH Group, um, that specifically r relates to digital forensics, uh, high tech investigations, cybersecurity, um, e discovery, and that kind of. Uh, technology field. Um, we also do a lot of work these days, although it's not necessarily pertinent to what we're going to talk about today in uh, Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain uh, investigations and forensics. So um, <clears throat> in, in that realm, we deal with and have many, many, a, a very high percentage of our clientele are attorneys and law firms for uh, for obvious reasons. And although uh, the mainstay of our work has not traditionally been affirmative cybersecurity, uh, you know, coming in and helping people secure their networks and computer infrastructure, et cetera, on an affirmative basis, we certainly have that skill set. Um, and we've been called upon many, many times by our existing law firm clients who know we have that skill set when a problem happens to come in and, and, and assist them um, on a reactive type basis. And, and of course, a few months ago when this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic hit uh, and uh, IT departments and IT providers all over were completely and utterly overwhelmed because everybody in the world immediately started needing to work remotely all at once. Uh, we, uh, you know, shifted a little bit, pivoted, uh, and started helping clients a lot more, um, you know, on an affirmative basis with cybersecurity. So you've been extraordinarily busy over the past three months. Uh, I have. Uh, I hope it doesn't show too much on my face uh, <laughs> and my droopy eyes, but uh, I haven't been getting a whole lot of sleep for the last few months. We have been literally, uh, my staff and I have been running around the clock six and seven days a week, um, you know, helping our existing clients, helping desperate new clients who, you know, can't get a call back from their IT company, uh, you know, and they're just overwhelmed uh, and helping individual lawyers and, and very small practices of one or two or, or three attorneys who really never did any significant amount of remote work and all of a sudden needed to and, and you know, were concerned enough and, and frankly smart enough to start asking a lot of questions, uh, you know, and get some uh, important information from a security point of view uh, in doing that. Right. So I think many of us are in that boat, that we're either small or solo law practices, and we're now working from home. Um, I've worked from home and worked remotely wherever I am for many years, and I guarantee I'm doing a lot wrong. So you're going to correct me today, and I'm going to probably make a huge list 
of things I need to do at the end of today. Um, but the reason why we decided to have you and include you in this discussion is because in past happy hours, a lot of individuals, a lot of lawyers have been saying, um, you know, I'm now doing remote virtual hearings on Zoom, but I'm afraid to show, you know, client documents. I don't know if it's secure. I don't know if this is secure or that's secure. I'm afraid of my client's information. And we all have ethical obligations, you know, despite where we're sitting at our home dining room table to make sure that we are protecting our client's information. So when a lot of lawyers talk about tech security, we say, well, is Zoom secure? And I noticed there was like an update today when I logged into Zoom, you know, today. So that's what the question is that most lawyers ask. Is that the question you would ask? I'm so glad that you framed that uh, question the way you did, because I cannot tell you how many times in the last two or three months, particularly, I've had to say to uh, clients or uh, folks that I was consulting with, including uh, sections of the New York State Bar Association, et cetera, you're asking the wrong question. Um, I've gotten uh, countless questions about Zoom's encryption, for example, over the last several months, right? Uh, Zoom was a, you know, somewhat used, somewhat well-known, uh, you know, video conferencing uh, platform uh, before COVID-19 and literally overnight it became the go-to communications platform, you know, for all professionals everywhere. Um, and used by, as you said, courts and, uh, you know, other groups. Um, and immediately I started getting questions about, uh, how, well, how strong is Zoom's uh, encryption? Is it really end-to-end -end encryption? Uh, and those questions are being asked by people who really don't uh, necessarily understand uh, the... Uh, right, the, that's because we see this on the internet. We right. see these articles that pop up on our Twitter feed and say, Zoom's not secure, don't use Zoom. Right, and in large part, you know, those questions are being filled by people that don't understand the, the, the technical details of how encryption works or one encryption versus, versus another, or the fact that end-to-end -end encryption is a different topic altogether and not directly related to the strength or weakness of any given encryption protocol. So it, it, the bottom line is this with Zoom. And by the way, you mentioned the update today. The update that was required by today but became available earlier in May uh, or required by uh, yesterday, I'm sorry, in order to log in is because Zoom saw all this criticism. Some of it was quasi-legitimate. Zoom was previously using an encryption protocol, which is virtually identical to your encrypted internet traffic over HTTPS. It's encrypted. How strong is it? Well, that depends on, you know, how qualified someone is to try and decrypt it after they intercept it. It's strong enough for most purposes, but people were criticizing it as not being strong. It's not government uh, uh, level encryption. It's not this, it's not that. And in response to that criticism, they seriously upped their game last month and rolled out a new AES GCM based encryption protocol, which is orders of magnitude stronger encryption than they were using previously, okay? They still don't have true end-to-end -end encryption on Zoom. Does, Does that, that matter? That, well, th that's, that's the point. It depends on who you are and, you know, how you think about this, right? So what does that mean? First of all, the new encryption protocol on Zoom is incredibly strong encryption, okay? If the traffic on this Zoom uh, uh, video conference were to be intercepted by a third party, okay, based on Zoom's current encryption, it would probably take them years, years to decrypt any of it, okay, uh, let alone all of it. But Zoom's encryption is not truly end to end. That's a separate issue from how strong the encryption protocol is. End to end encryption means that the data in question, in this case, the, the audio and video feed, is encrypted from the moment it leaves my laptop computer all the way to and through 
Zoom's servers and at all times while it's on Zoom's servers until it reaches your laptop in San Francisco or wherever you are and is decrypted so that you can see it and hear it and that the intermediary or uh, party in the middle or man in the middle as we say in my business um, in this case Zoom literally does not have the ability to decrypt any of that communication or transmission. In, in the case of Zoom, that's simply not true because Zoom generates the encryption and decryption keys for these Zoom conferences. And those keys are stored in a very safe and secure way, but they are stored on Zoom's servers. So someone who works at Zoom and has access to those encryption and decryption keys could theoretically pull a uh, Zoom meeting stream off their server or access it and decrypt it with those keys. If a hacker hacked Zoom servers and successfully stole those decryption keys and they intercepted some Zoom communications or, or meetings, they could also theoretically decrypt them and view them because they would have the decryption keys. The, the opposite of that is true end-to-end -end encryption, where the party who set up and hosted this Zoom conference generated the encryption and decryption keys, and no one else in the world has them except that party, and the other participants have uh, the, the, the public key that's needed on their end to decrypt. Um, but that's not necessarily any safer than Zoom having them on their server. So it's it's... In fact, I, I would say that it's way, way safer for Zoom to have the decryption keys on their server than it is for uh, you, Melissa, not to pick on you, but, you know, anyone in your position having been, you know, the host setting this up, uh, for you to have generated and stored those decryption keys. Zoom spends millions and millions of dollars, you know, securing their server and has a whole team of people who are devoted just to the security of the server where the decryption keys are stored. So they're about as safe as they could possibly be anywhere. Um, so everything I just talked about, I think is not really what. It's not the question. It's right. not the question we need to be asking. It, it's not the question we need to be asking. And, and I apologize that I went into such detail on it, but you know, all of that's kind of important. If you're a cybersecurity expert, and you know you're dealing with upgrading a system or making a system more secure um, from an individual standpoint there are literally you know a hundred things that are far more important and far more basic and and quite frankly this is not just my opinion statistics flesh this out um, infinitely more likely to cause a security breach or a compromise of your data or electronic communications than Zoom servers being breached and someone successfully decrypting your Zoom communication or the, you know, the content of your online Zoom hearing uh, in which you showed confidential documents. You know, is that possible? Sure, it's possible. Um, we know that big companies do get hacked. You know, Yahoo got hacked. Uh, Target's been hacked. Uh, many other big, you know, known companies who spend millions of dollars on security have been hacked. It can happen. It doesn't happen that frequently. What happens much more often, and when I say much more often, I mean literally millions of times more frequently, is an individual's computer at work or at home or network at home uh, is compromised. And that's it's user error. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Lawyers trying to be tech experts and doing it wrong. Yeah, I, and, and it all comes down to, to this. And you know, we'll get into uh, some specifics you know, about the things that are really important to do. But, but before I do, I just, I'll preface by saying, I apologize in advance if many of the things that we're going to talk about now sound like a speech from the CDC about washing your hands 
covering your mouth, you know, with a, with a face covering when you're out in public uh, and staying six feet away from other people, uh, you know, who may be sick. Um, the fact of the matter is, in, in my experience, and, you know, my experience is extensive, the, the, probably 90% of security breaches, even the ones at larger companies and larger firms, uh, have their genesis at a basic human error or a basic human failure to do something uh, or a mistake by a user in doing something. Uh, clicking on the wrong thing, um, you know, failing to, you know, have updated uh, an operating system, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, it comes down to uh, to really basic stuff. And, and I think, you yeah. know, we should go through that. Yeah. And, you know. So I, I know there are some questions in, uh, that are coming up. And if we have some time, I'll get to them. But there are some key things that you and I have already discussed that I want to make sure we hit on because they seem really important. And I'm not sure I'm even doing all of them to make sure that I'm taking the proper steps to make sure that what I'm using is secure. So the first thing, operating systems. My Mac asked me to op, you know, update my operating system, my iPhone, my iPad, everything last night, decided it wanted to update at the same exact time, actually wanted to update before that time, but I had some calls that I had to make using Zoom. And I'm like, nope, click later, click later. What do we need to be doing with our actual devices and updating them to make sure that we're doing our due diligence? I hope I don't get sued by Nike for saying this, but just do it. When it comes to the things you just said, um, you have to update your operating systems. You're using your laptop to do work from home. You're using your iPhone and maybe your iPad uh, now, not just for personal reasons, but for business reasons, right? You are having confidential communications across these devices. You have confidential data on these devices. Um, <clears throat> The operating systems on these devices, okay, are updated on a regular basis by Mac, uh, by Windows, uh, by Android, right? Um, why? Well, for basically two reasons. One, to improve performance because people have complained about this, that, or the other thing, or, or they're rolling out some, some new feature. And two, okay, which is probably even more prevalent than one they have discovered or they have been made aware of a security vulnerability in their operating system which can be exploited by hackers to do some bad thing okay immediately the good companies you know windows mac uh android as soon as they become aware of those things they make note of it and if they're not already scheduling you know uh, an update they will make a patch and roll out an update very soon. And it is incredibly important to do that because again, statistics flesh this out. The vast majority of compromises on systems, and I say that it, it generally, it, it doesn't matter if it's your laptop or your home desktop or a server at someone's office. The vast majority of compromises happen through a known security vulnerability in an operating system or a program that a hacker exploits and very very often it was something that a patch or update was available to fix before the exploit happened but nobody did it okay that's human error um and and that's something that's easily prevented um by updating your operating system on your your laptop your desktop your iphone your ipad your android phone etc every time it tells you to do it. I know that's annoying because uh, it takes a little time and it puts the device at a service. We usually do them overnight, um, you know, um, and sometimes there are on occasion some ill effects, right? You do an iOS upgrade or update on your phone and all of a sudden your phone starts behaving a little differently and it's very annoying. We've all had that experience. But from a security point of view, it is absolutely essential to update your operating systems on every device you use whenever you are prompted to do so. And if you're not prompted to do so, you know, 
especially like, for example, on a Windows computer or a Mac computer, you may not be prompted to do so right away or at all. Go into your settings and check for updates. Make sure that automatic updates is turned on. You can schedule it when you want it to happen in the middle of the night or what have you, but affirmatively check those things to make sure your operating systems are up to date, even if you haven't been prompted. So what about antivirus software? Because I also got that email yesterday saying my annual subscription to McAfee is due. Um, frankly, I haven't been using it. Apple, the Apple store turned it off for me because it said, oh, our devices are already secure and it's slowing you down and using a lot of memory and data. So should I be getting some type of antivirus software? Okay. <sighs> This is a tough one. The answer is yes, with exceptions. Like, you know, there's a great lawyer answer, right? Um, antivirus software is very, very important, particularly on Windows machines. I have nothing against Windows. Windows is my preferred operating system. Um, I have plenty of Windows computers, Mac computers, devices running every kind of iOS, uh, OS. So uh, antivirus software is very, very important. It does impact performance, period. There is no antivirus software worth its salt in, in, in the world that doesn't on some level impact performance. It is extremely important that you have antivirus software on any Windows computer, in my opinion, and that it's up to date. Because as you just indicated, your subscription had expired. That means by definition, your antivirus software was definitely not being updated on a daily or even at least on a weekly basis, it should be daily. Antivirus software should be on every Windows machine, period. It's advisable to have it on other devices. Anti a lot of antivirus softwares, uh, I'll mention a couple that are good, um, have versions that will run on Mac and on iOS and on Android, okay? Uh, PC Matic is one of them. Uh, AVG um, is another uh, there's nothing, nothing against McAfee, which you mentioned, uh, not one of my favorites, but that's uh, not because it's, it's not decent. It is. Um, Norton is also very good. Um, <clears throat> Mac operating systems and particularly iOS, okay, uh, m m the operating system on uh, Apple mobile devices are far less susceptible to viruses and malware than Windows machines. That's a, a statistical fact. That's not my opinion. Um, that doesn't mean they can't get infected by a virus or malware. They can, okay? They're just far less susceptible. It is good practice to have antivirus software on your Mac, on your iOS device. Uh, certainly, certainly on your Android device and, and your uh, Windows devices. Yes. And it's critically important that the subscription not only be active, but even if your subscription is active, make absolutely sure that the virus database is updating every day or every week. Go into the program, look for scheduled updates to make sure. Because if the virus definitions are out of date, it's virtually doing you no good. It's not going to pick up a virus or a piece of malware that just came out a few weeks ago or last month, if your virus definitions database in the antivirus software is two or three months old. So very important to have it, extremely important that it's updated frequently, uh, preferably on a daily basis. Any concerns about the free ones, like the free malware bytes type of antivirus? Uh, first of all, malware bytes in my opinion, um, is not a good antivirus software to have resident on your computer and running to prevent viruses and malware. Um, that said, I I'm not knocking, we use it and 20 other uh, programs like it to scan uh, machines or, or file volumes for viruses because they all can miss things. Um, so uh, I would say, you know, Norton, 360 is very good. Uh, PC Matic, which is relatively new on the block, but it's a US based uh, company uh, and has gotten rave reviews and very good marks in a lot of industry tests. Um, 
you know, I, I haven't personally tested it or worked with it, um, but I've read very good things about it. Um, and uh, a couple of my guys who have uh, used it and tested it said it's, it's got very minimal impact on performance, which is important to a lot of people. Um, AVG uh, is another one that I, I like very much, um, which also AVG along with their excellent antivirus and AVG does have a free version, okay? And, and, and perhaps this is a good answer to your question. AVG has a free antivirus tool that you can download and renew every year and update the virus definitions and never pay a penny. But it's going to impact your performance on your machine a lot more than their paid professional version will. Okay? Got it. Um, Always. It's, you can't get something for free, right? So speaking of free. Well, you, can, you can, but you get what you pay for usually. That's true. So speaking of what I, what I pay for, I am a habitual public internet Wi-Fi user. I travel a lot. I always log in shame, the hotel. Shame, I know, I know. Shame, I'm, I'm admitting all my bad habits to you. You told this me is like, to this is very therapeutic for me. Um, so I go to conferences. I log in. I think we all do. We go to an American Bar Association conference, and we're all sitting there, supposed to be watching the CLEs, but instead we're logged into the hotel's Wi-Fi, checking our client emails and you know, getting whatever documents they send us and downloading them to our computers. Or I heard of a colleague recently who said, I can't work at home, my kids are there. So I go and drive and sit in my car next to the Starbucks and use their Wi-Fi and work, you know, do my work, whatever it might be. What are we exposing ourselves to when we do that? And how can we fix that if we need to? Um, the, the, the better question is, what aren't you exposing yourself to? Uh, but to, to, to answer that specifically, it is a horrible practice from a security point of view. And I, I can't stress that enough. Um, this is incredibly important. I, I see people who do a lot of the right things in terms of, oh, my operating system's up to date. I have antivirus. I have Norton 360 on all my devices, which includes, by the way, a VPN, which I'll talk about in, in a bit. Um, you know, uh, that is an excellent, uh, you know, uh, added layer of security in a lot of respects. Um, but they do the things that you just said, which is they go to Starbucks and they log into Starbucks Wi-Fi or the Wi-Fi at the library or the courthouse or yeah. wherever uh, or at the airport and they're doing sensitive work or they're not. They're just surfing the internet, but they connect it to this public Wi-Fi, free public Wi-Fi. Um, the problem here is twofold. Number one, you're now on a, you have now connected your device, your laptop, your phone, your tablet, to a network that you know nothing about. You know nothing about who else is on that network um, and nothing about uh, what they're doing on that network, okay? Um, and I don't mean the guy sitting next to you, you know, what he may be engaged in unless he's engaged in trying to steal your stuff. Um, and the, the problem is um, by connecting to that network, and now you're going to have emails and other communications. You're going to have internet traffic going back and forth. Uh, you're logging into things, et cetera. All that traffic is going across this network. Now, granted, some of that traffic is secured and or encrypted to some level depending on what platform you're using to generate and receive that traffic. You're sending the emails, you know, uh, through Microsoft Outlook. Uh, there is, despite the, the people who would argue this point from semantics, uh, uh, there is a form of encryption going on in your, in your Outlook email um, when it leaves, you know, your uh, Outlook program and, and is destined somewhere else. Um, your HTTPS traffic over the internet is to some degree encrypted. Um, the problem is anyone who's logged into that network, um, which could literally be anyone, um, can be intercepting that traffic. Okay. So there's a, um, there's a, uh, a solution to that, and it's called VPN. 
And for example, I mentioned Norton 360. Um, uh, they have a built-in VPN. There are lots of other VPN tools. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. It is basically a tool, an, a, an app or a software tool, if you will, that you put on your laptop or your phone or your tablet, which you launch and it runs in the background. And when you uh, send and receive traffic, when you log on to the internet, okay, and traffic is going back and forth, you're using an internet browser, okay, the traffic that's going back and forth is encrypted very well in this encrypted tunnel, it's called, through the use of the VPN, okay? The problem is that while it, if you're running a VPN, and, and I get this response, people say, yeah, well, I use the public Wi-Fi at Starbucks, but I have um, Invincible or I have uh, Norton 360 VPN on my laptop. So I'm all good. No, you're not all good. The problem that people are missing in that equation is assuming you're using a VPN, which is a very good thing to do, that is solving the problem of your transmissions, your traffic going out through your laptop or device over that network and coming back to you being encrypted so that those specific transmissions, that specific data cannot be, uh, it's not that it can't be intercepted, it still could, but if it were intercepted, it's fully encrypted and you don't have any concerns because whoever intercepted it can't read it or discern even what it is, let alone what it says. Um, the problem is you've connected your laptop or device to this network. And even if you're running a VPN, if I am a bad actor, I'm a hacker, and I'm sitting on that Starbucks network, I can see your device and I can do things to access your device, not your communications that are going back and forth through this VPN. Those may be protected from me by virtue of the VPN, but I can literally get access to your device if I know what I'm doing. And I may be able to put things like malware on your device. I may be able to access files and things that are on your device that you're not even using right now. You're not emailing them. You're not uploading them. They're just sitting on your device. I, there are ways I can access that data simply by virtue of the fact that you are now logged on and connected to this network. Okay. Um, that's the huge risk. That's why I tell people just don't do it. The, the solution that is way better is a hotspot, right? Most smartphones now can be tethered and, uh, to your laptop and used as a mobile hotspot. If the performance of that is not sufficient for you or you are outside of your home or office frequently enough to warrant it, you can buy a 4G uh, or now 5G mobile hotspot from Verizon or AT&T um, for a few hundred dollars. Um, I, we, I bought another one the other day for a client, $199, and get unlimited data service on it for under $100 a month. I think $79 a month is the going rate right now for unlimited data service. And use that instead of using public Wi-Fi anywhere. I never use public Wi-Fi, not in the airport, not in the library, not in a hotel that I'm staying at, no matter how nice and high-end that hotel is. Hotel Wi-Fi networks are absolutely notorious for bad things happening to people who log into them, all right? Um, so uh, a hotspot from one of these companies solves a lot of that problem just on its own out of the box because now you're on your own private dedicated internet connection. Is that hackable? Yes. Uh, the chances of that happening are, you know, a thousand times less than you getting hacked by being connected to public Wi-Fi. Okay. Uh, and what I just said, you know, it goes for using your phone uh, tethered to your device or using a dedicated uh, four or 5G uh, hotspot. Some of the 
four and 5G hotspots from Verizon and AT&T. You can even go further if you really, really want to make them secure. If I take my 4G hotspot and I go to Starbucks, I put it on the table next to me, I fire it up, I fire up my laptop, and now I'm connected to the I'm connected to the internet from the Wi-Fi being generated by my personal hotspot that's sitting next to me. Okay, very good, a oh, thousand times safer than using the public Wi-Fi in Starbucks. Is it totally secure? No, because the hacker sitting on the other side of Starbucks sees that a new SSID, a new Wi-Fi network just popped up in the area, right? Called Verizon 123, you know, L. Um, he may take an interest in that and say, huh, let me see if I can access that network. And if that hacker is good and skillful, they may be able to access that, your little private Wi-Fi that you just fired up, okay? Obviously not as easy as accessing Starbucks Wi-Fi because they're letting everyone on, period. Um, they actually have to hack into your Wi-Fi first and then hack into your device from there it becomes increasingly, you know, uh, more difficult. But you can even prevent that because on many of these Wi-Fi devices and you can check or ask before you purchase it, can I make the SSID produced by this hotspot I'm buying a hidden SSID? Meaning, can I cloak it or hide it so that it doesn't broadcast to anyone and everyone who has a Wi-Fi enabled device in the area, you have to know the name of it to know it's there in the first place. You have to manually enter it. Excellent, excellent security tip, okay? Because a hacker who's scanning for Wi-Fi networks to exploit and breach isn't going to find your Wi-Fi network in the first place, so they're not going to try and hack it. Um, the other thing that can be done with these devices, which we do for clients, this is not so simple. Um, you can do it yourself. You can find uh, tutorials on YouTube how to do it, but it's called MAC address restriction, okay? Every device that is Wi-Fi capable, your laptop, your phone, your tablet, even most desktop computers, if the device is Wi-Fi capable, it has something called a MAC address, M-A-C address. Okay, that is its unique identification code or number that identifies it on wireless networks. Okay, um, you can program a 4G or 5G hotspot, assuming it's a programmable one, you can MAC address restrict it. You can get the MAC address of your laptop, of your iPhone, of your iPad, and you can program that hotspot to only communicate with devices bearing those three MAC addresses. That means no one else can connect to it. So even if a hacker somehow figured out that your hidden Wi-Fi signal was being broadcast and said, I'm going to try and hack it, you've just made it a thousand times more difficult for them to try and hack it to the point where I assure you, a hacker that sees this is a MAC address restricted environment will immediately move on because no one is going to even waste their time trying to bypass a MAC address restricted network um, by emulating MAC addresses and doing other very sophisticated hacking uh, 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 things. Um, they're immediately just going to move on. So 4G, 5G hotspot, uh, Hidden SSID is the next level up. If you can do it, great. Beyond that, if you want even better security, MAC address restricted to only talk to your devices. You do that instead of accessing public Wi-Fi, and you've literally just decreased your chances of being hacked by orders and orders of magnitude. Sounds like I've got some shopping to do tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so you keep using the word encryption. Tell me, is this something that I can, a setting on my computer, something I can do to make my computer itself more secure besides not connecting to public Wi-Fi and, you know, my 
you know, updating my operating system, whatever it might be. What do I need to do else to make sure this is encrypted? So I have mentioned encryption several times already. Uh, and that's because the, the issue or concept of encryption comes up in a lot of different contexts, right? So this Zoom call that we're on right now is encrypted. The, the data that's being transited back and forth between our individual devices uh, and Zoom servers and back and forth is encrypted. And I explained what that meant earlier, meaning, you know, the, the data cannot be read or interpreted or viewed by a third party unless they have the appropriate decryption key after they get the data, right? Um, uh, and it's uh, a, a concept that cuts across uh, all areas of computer security. Um, when it comes to your devices, this is an excellent question and it's very important. Um, iOS devices, your iPhone, your iPad, um, they have settings on them, okay? If you have uh, an advanced lock code on your device, okay, the data on that device is encrypted until your device is unlocked, okay? I'm not talking about your communications now. I'm not talking about your text messages, uh, particularly SMS, for example. People always ask me about encryption with messages and stuff. Um, SMS messages, okay, old-fashioned text messages. You have an iPhone, I have an Android, you send me a text message. It's SMS, it's not an iMessage. Um, that's not encrypted, okay, period. Uh, it's plain text. And if it gets intercepted, someone's reading it. Um, but I'm talking about encryption of the data on your devices. Um, so your iPhone, your uh, uh, Android device, your iPad, as long as you have a lock code on them and you have the security functions enabled, okay, um, that data is encrypted and incredibly difficult. If you lose your iPhone, you lose your iPad, you lose your Android phone, as long as you have a good lock code on it, incredibly difficult to bypass those lock codes and extract the data from those devices, okay? You have to make sure you have a good Lock code, it can't be one, two, three, four. First of all, you should, you should use six digit lock codes, not four, okay? Or on an Android, you know, a, a good strong password. Um, uh, by the way, don't use these. Um, uh, uh, oh, the swipe things? These swipe unlocks, okay? Uh, there, are, there are a lot of little hacker tricks uh, to bypass that. Um, use a um, use a good strong password or a six digit lock code on iOS devices and make sure the device is set to automatically lock in a very short period of time when not used. It's annoying to keep having to enter your code. And so people either go to settings and they go to auto lock and they say never. Uh, that's a horrible thing to do where they set it for 30 minutes. If what you about the face heart, recognition? Uh, well, the, the face recognition is actually fine, um, as is uh, thumbprint recognition, because they, you know, they're um, they're pretty secure. Um, right. Uh, I think if someone cuts off my thumb, they, I have bigger problems. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, for the well, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how many matrimonial uh, attorneys are, are are on the the call right now, but I will say, you know, in certain context in matrimonial cases where we do a lot of unique security consulting. And I know that you matrimonial attorneys will know exactly what I'm talking about. We tell people they have to not use, not use facial recognition or thumbprints because I can't tell you how many cases we've had where the spouse literally takes the phone and holds it up to the spouse's face while they're sleeping or puts the spouse's thumb on the phone and unlocks the phone and gets access. But in the context we're talking about that, doesn't really apply. So, you know, uh, the lock codes have to be set and the auto lock functions have to be on on your mobile devices and they have to be short, set for short periods of time. And if that's the case and you lose the device, you leave it in Starbucks, there's not really a major concern because I can tell you from firsthand experience, you give me an iPhone that's got a six digit lock code on it, you know, uh, the data on it's encrypted in all current iOS versions, you give that to me, you could offer me the sun, the moon, and the stars to get into it for you. And uh, if we get in, if we get in, it's going to take a couple of years. Okay. That's, that's how difficult it is. So 
uh, I, I don't think you have to worry beyond that, right? The, that's more than reasonable uh, security precaution. Now with laptops, this is very important. We carry our laptops around, um, maybe less so these days, uh, but very shortly we'll be taking them around a lot more again to the courthouse, the library, Starbucks, what have you. Um, and people have a password to log into their laptop, uh, their Windows laptop or their Mac. Um, and I say to them, well, is your data encrypted on your, uh, on your laptop that you're carrying around all over the place that you might leave in the airport or in Starbucks or, or, or anywhere else, or it might be stolen out of your car? Um, and they say, well, I have a password. Passwords in this context, a Windows login password or a password to log into a Mac means nothing to someone like myself trying to get into the device. Literally means nothing. Okay, we bypass that. It's like child's play. Um, as opposed to the data on the device being encrypted. I'm not talking about VPNs now, encrypting data streams going back and forth. I'm talking about the, the, the data on your hard drive, on your laptop being fully encrypted. That is a game changer. That means if you give me that laptop and say, I need the data off this laptop, I'll give you the sun, the moon, and the stars, I can't help you. If you have a Mac, make sure File Vault is turned on. File Vault is Mac's built in whole drive encryption for the hard drive on your MacBook or your MacBook Air. Okay. And if it's on and you lose that MacBook and someone doesn't have your login now, now that login that you're using to log into your Mac isn't just a login, it's the decryption key for your file vault. And if you give me someone's Mac that's file vault and then say, get me the data off here, my answer is gonna be, okay, I can get you the data off this MacBook very easily. I can't read it and you can't read it and no one will be able to read it because it will take you years and years and years to try and crack this decryption, okay? On, on a Windows machine, if you have a Windows laptop that you use for work, I implore you, make sure it's running Windows 10 Pro, not Windows 10 Home or Windows 10 anything else because they have a bunch of different versions now. Windows 10 Pro, that doesn't mean don't buy a laptop that doesn't have it on there. Uh, if you don't have Windows 10 Pro, you can upgrade to it uh, on a brand new laptop or even on a laptop you've been using for some time for 99 bucks. Windows 10 Pro has a feature called BitLocker. It's the same thing as File Vault on a Mac. BitLocker is very strong. Whole disk encryption for your laptop. Uh, you can do desktops too, but I don't worry so much about desktops. We don't carry them around unless someone burglarizes your house or your office. It's not much of a problem. But laptops, it's critical, right? So Windows, BitLocker, Macs, File Vault. If those things are enabled, if you're laptop is off or at least locked and you lose it or it's stolen, I don't think you have a very serious problem other than you're out, you know, a thousand or two thousand dollars, the value of the device, because no one is cracking BitLocker or File Vault encryption anytime in the near future. Um, so... Right. That's so, so if we're planning on losing our device, which hopefully we're not planning on that, I imagine you know, you're out the price of a laptop, but the data on the laptop, I imagine everyone should be considering backing that up. I mean, that's not necessarily a security thing necessarily per se, but backing up and having that data somewhere else, do we need to be concerned about that? Whether it's on the cloud, whether it's on a device sitting at, on our computer or near our computer, or whether you do it at the office somewhere. Sure. Um so, and again, this, this applies, you know, particularly for um, solo or, or small firm practitioners who may not have a, you know, a dedicated firm wide system in place, you know, for how this is done, right? File servers, which are backed up routinely, et cetera. Um, the, the answer is absolutely. You've, you've got to have a means of backing up. Um, and although from a security point of view, uh, 
obviously the safest way to do that um, would be to plug in a removable four terabyte hard drive uh, and copy the data to that and then put it in a safe, right? That's unhackable. But we, that's not very convenient and it's not very practical and you'll forget to do it and your backups will be dated, you know, when you need them. Uh, so it, it doesn't really work. And, and the fact is there are, there are lots of ways to do that now um, with cloud services, which are very secure. In fact, probably much more secure than your personal computing environment. And again, that's kind of the concept here, right? Like what is the weakest link? You know, there's Dropbox Professional, great tool. We use it in, in my firm for a lot of things, okay? Um, Carbonite is an excellent, very secure backup service um, that, that runs very seamlessly and really has very minimal impact on performance. Um, now, Carbonite is not gonna help you like share documents and data across devices. Um, it, it won't. It's just a backup tool. It's a very good one um, and very secure. Um, the data is encrypted uh, while it's in transit from you to them. It's encrypted while it's sitting on their servers. It's very secure, okay? Um, Dropbox Professional, same thing. Uh, good level of encryption, excellent security. What's critical about both of those services, right? Uh, and, and of course, Dropbox is does a lot of things to help you in your working environment that something like Carbonite doesn't, right? You can have Dropbox on your laptop, your desktop, and a couple other devices, and all your uh, files and documents will, will sync across those devices, and that's great. Um, and it is uh, encrypted and very secure. What's critical is this. You're using a, a cloud service, which means there are login credentials for it, right? Documents on your laptop hard drive are safe as long as no one gets a hold of your laptop or gets into your laptop, right? And they, they can be encrypted as I discussed before, et cetera. Now you're talking about storing stuff in the cloud. It doesn't matter how good Carbonite security is, how strong their encryption is, or Dropbox for that matter, if someone gets your credentials for that account or is able to figure out your username and password for that account. Um, if your username for your Dropbox professional account is your email address and the password is something simple, okay, I can probably hack your Dropbox account pretty easily. Not because Dropbox doesn't have excellent security, they do but their security is not designed to prevent someone with the proper username and password for getting in. So, uh, strong passwords. And when I say strong password, I mean a complex password, a password that is eight, 12, 15 characters long, that has numbers and letters and special characters. So okay? I'm never gonna remember those. What do you think about using things like LastPass or saving them on your, like Apple always asks me if I want to save my password. So here's what I think about that. Um, LastPass, great. RoboForm, great. Their security is better than anything you're ever going to do on your end. They will ne their security will never be the wink link in your personal computing equation. Okay. The other thing that's fantastic about them is, they will generate for you or allow you to click and generate excellent, long, complex passwords, different ones for all your different accounts and services that you use, and they'll remember them for you. And all you have to remember is one complex master password that you commit to memory. And there's even tricks for doing that, you know, make it, you know, make it a word or a phrase where you replace some of the letters with numbers or symbols that look like the letters, et cetera. Come on, you can come up with something that's complex and yet memorable to you if you only need to do that for one, which is your master password for your last pass or your RoboForm. Um, and, and, and they're great um, as long as you have a, a good complex master password for them. Um, I, I think they're fantastic. Um, now, that is very, very, very different from allowing Google Chrome 
or your uh, or Safari to remember passwords and login credentials for you in basically your internet cache. That is a terrible, terrible thing to do. That is a major security risk and flaw. Um, so yes to uh, password keepers like uh, LastPass and RoboForm. No to ever saying yes for a browser to save your login information to anything that you care about. Uh, and while I'm on the topic, I mentioned Dropbox and other cloud services before. Two-factor authentication, I think you all know what that is, okay? Having the requirement that even if the proper username and password is entered to an account, and when I say account, we could be talking about your Dropbox, your Microsoft Office 365 account, or any other account like that that has critical confidential data in it, in my opinion, this is only my opinion, it, in this day and age, the way we are using Microsoft Office 365 and Dropbox and similar services for our clients' confidential information, I would say that it's almost per se negligent not to have enabled two-factor authentication requirement to log into any of those accounts. Because if you don't, and I guess or figure out or am able to brute force your password for your Dropbox or your Microsoft Office 365 account and you don't have two-factor authentication, I just took the keys to the kingdom. I got your whole Dropbox. I got your whole Outlook done. And we see it every day. And it's terrible when it happens. So two-factor authentication is really, really important. And does this rule apply also for passwords on, say, your iPhone, your iPad? You know, don't save them. Um, well, when you say passwords on the iPhone or the iPad, uh, are you talking about the the unlock codes to get into the device or something else? Well, I mean, uh, I think at least because I use Apple products across the board, some of my passwords that, you know, Safari kind of gets, it translates to my iPhone and my iPad and everything like that. Uh, Just clear the cache. Is that the answer? Yeah, if, 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 the, if the browser is asking you to save a, pass, a login or a password, the answer is repeatedly no. Now, Apple Keychain is different. Um, Apple devices will have certain stored uh, passwords in an encrypted keychain on a device, um, you know, that, that go with your apps, et cetera. That's, that's different. And you can use your, uh, you know, your thumbprint or yes. your face ID for yes. those particular yes. ones, and, and that's and, okay. Yes, and that, that's perfectly okay because those passwords, okay, that's not the browser. That's not Safari or Google Chrome or, or, or a browser saving your, pa your passwords or credentials in a cache. That's actually being saved on uh, something called an encrypted keychain on your iOS Got device. It. And, uh, and th that is being accessed by you either putting in your Apple ID password as the master password or using your thumbprint or your face. And that is actually okay. Okay, well, it's five o'clock and I, we could probably keep talking forever. Um, but I think I have a to-do list a mile long that I'm gonna be working on all evening tonight and I'm going to be purchasing some new tech uh, gadgets to make sure I'm more secure. But for right now, I wanna thank you so much, Nick. Um, I really appreciate it. I think uh, you just helped a lot of us make sure that we're meeting our ethical obligations as we're working from home, we're working remotely, wherever that is, to, to make sure we're protecting both our data and our clients' data. Um, if I get any additional questions, um, I'll, I'll reach out to you separately. And um, thank you. I, I can't uh, thank you enough. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Like I said, I, I, I really like, you know, helping folks, especially, you know, uh, fellow uh, attorneys um, with this issue, because I know it's, it's very important to everybody, especially now with these circumstances. Um, and, and to that end, I'm sure people have follow-up questions. I'm happy to answer them as best as I can. Um, if anyone wants to email me uh, questions or email you questions and you can forward them to me, I'll, I'll try to answer them as, as you know promptly as I can and, and get back to folks. And if anybody has an issue or problem that they think you know needs more than just a, a quick email back and forth, uh, I'm happy to try and jump on a call with them and help if I can. Thank you so much.
Well, thanks, okay. and I hope everyone has a good, safe, healthy evening. And um, we will talk to you soon. Anyone on the call, you'll be getting an email about our next happy hour, which we're spreading them out a little more. It's gonna be June 30th. Uh, and so we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much.